Without further ado, my name is Stephanie Hare. Hello, I will be moderating this panel on whether we need a new generation of defense companies. Maybe everything is fine. Um, to my right is Torsten Reil, who's co-founder and CEO of Helsing. To my left is David von Veil, Assistant Secretary General of NATO. So, incarnating the private sector point of view on behalf of all companies everywhere, incarnating government and supranational governments. Um, thank you both very much. Before we get into the conversation, um, I'd like to acknowledge that Tom Fletcher couldn't be with us today. His boys tested positive for COVID last night. So we have a slightly more intimate conversation ahead of us, and that'll give us some time. I'd like to ask both of our speakers to explain a little bit about what they do so that we know where they're coming from before we dive into this contentious, controversial topic. So, Torsten, if you'll go first. Uh, yeah, happy to. I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm Torsten Ryle. I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of Helsing. Uh, I'm actually originally a biologist um, uh, quite some time ago. Um, then after that, started a games company here in the UK called Natural Motion, uh, which I sold in, uh, in 2014. And after that, started to uh, invest in companies across uh, the UK and Europe and, and realized throughout that that we are starting to fall behind in a number of key technologies. Uh, in liberal democracies in general, but in, uh, in Europe in particular, and that's, you know, whether that's quantum, um, semiconductors, energy, but also AI and software, and specifically uh, AI and software applied to defense. And the reason that matters is because defense is becoming a software problem, but the existing companies in this space, the big primes and contractors, are not software companies, they're hardware companies. And so the way they approach software um, is more similar to the way a big automotive company would approach software. Um, they're finding it hard to attract the right talent, um, to retain it, to create the right culture, to develop in an agile way, very fast, um, really advanced architectures. And so this creates a big, um, uh, I think, gap um, and um, a big blind side for us because, as I said, defense is becoming a software problem. And if we are not able to develop those capabilities, and then we will have a real problem. And I think that's now even more the case. I should say we started this company, Helsing, in March last year. Obviously, since then, world events have kind of overtaken some of the plans. And with um, Russia and Ukraine, I think it's becoming even more clear that there is now a big gap. So around the time, this was maybe uh, 2020 or so, I was looking to invest in companies in defense um, in, in Europe for that reason. And I couldn't find any. Um, and so that was the reason why we, and that's three um, co-founders, eventually started the company Helsing um, first last year in March with a seed round of 8.5 million uh, euros, and then later on uh, with a Series A also last year of 102.5 million euros. So I think we're quite well funded as a defense startup, um, quite unusually so, which I'm sure we get a bit of a chance to talk about later. Why, why is it so hard to raise money in this space um, usually? Um, and maybe just finally, what we focus on as Helsing is software only. Um, we provide software capabilities to um, the armed forces, specifically focusing on the UK, Germany and France, um, at least for starters. And um, it's specifically about adding capabilities to existing assets. And so that's vehicles, effectors, etc. Connecting them up, giving them compute and really amping up what they're able to do. So that's, I guess, Helsing in a nutshell. Thank you so much for that. Um, David, a few, a few moments from you about your perspective and what you specifically are doing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for emerging security challenges at NATO, uh, which is a very ominous job title, but basically what it means is that I'm responsible for everything that's not the traditional hardcore uh, military operations of NATO. So I'm responsible for cyber, uh, for counterterrorism, uh, but also for climate change and the security implications of climate change. Energy security, which has become uh, really uh, hot again uh, now uh, with the war of Russia against Ukraine. Um, and uh, mainly what brings me here today is innovation. Uh, so in innovation, we've realized that the latest innovation doesn't come from the defense sector anymore. Uh, we used to be leading with GPS, with the internet, with duct tape even. Uh, but uh, nowadays, the uh, new innovation is coming out of the private sector. It's coming out of startup communities. So my mission is to reconnect NATO and the defense sector to where the innovation actually happens. Brilliant. Uh, so this will not be a boring conversation. I think we've established that. Um, what I'd like to do then is take it straight from the top. The, the title of this talk is why do we need a new generation of defense companies? But I'd actually like to even just challenge that assumption and say, do we? So first of all, you just sort of raised something there, which is that 
back in the day, innovation was coming from military, which of course is funded by government, and then would trickle through into the private sector. And that there's been a flipping of that. And now we're seeing innovation coming from the private sector and a feeling, we can test that feeling, um, that military and government's innovation is perhaps falling behind. So do, can you explain, both of you, the point of view on that, of where did the flip occur? And then do we need to bring it back? Where should innov innovation be coming from? So, yeah, thank you. I, I do think we need a new generation of defense companies. I do think we saw that flip. I can't point to exactly when that happened. Uh, but what we did do over the years, especially in the 90s, is bring down the research and development budgets of governments in general, uh, but also of uh, ministries of defense. Uh, and less R&D meant leaving it more to the market. And that worked pretty well. I mean, we still have nine out of the best 10 universities in allied countries. Uh, we still have 80% of all living Nobel laureates coming from uh, NATO countries. Um, so innovation is thriving. Uh, only the main driver for innovation is now the commercial applicability uh, of innovations coming out. Uh, and that has created a gap between defense uh, and the civil world when it comes down to innovation. Just one example, uh, in logistics, we can now see big tech companies using drones or automated warehouses to deliver whatever, whenever, uh, uh, to uh, the user. Whilst in the world of defense, we are still driving 10-ton diesel trucks based on Excel web sheets uh, uh, to do our planning. And we can see now in Ukraine how vulnerable something uh, quite essential like logistics is. It's just one example where I feel that we've been left behind uh, and we need to reconnect to that innovation ecosystem and we need to do so in a responsible way. We need to show that we are actually part of defending our values and democracies uh, and we're not in the same line as uh, tobacco companies or gambling companies, uh, uh, which has often been the uh, equation that's been mentioned when it comes down to uh, the defense industry or the defense sector. Thank you. I wanted to pick up again on this question of the flip. Do you think it might be something to do with the end of the Cold War in the 1990s? And we had seen incredible military expenditure from the Second World War up until the collapse of the USSR. Was that when it starts to pivot and money is, is cut from government spending? And I don't have the, the data to back this up. This is a question I'm asking as a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Where did, where did we see money go? Was it like, oh, the threat, the threat is gone, it's the end of history, the liberal democracies have, have won? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would have been part of the reason. It, it actually um, it, it kind of decreased government spending won't have been uh, the real catalyst, to be honest. I think what, what happened around the time was that a lot of companies consolidated, there were a lot of mergers, um, there are only very few companies left now, so competition in general has gone down in the sector. I think that's problem number one, but also it um, solidified the cost plus model, which has been, um, you know, for quite some time, for decades now, been the, the dominant model in the space. So that, that means that those large contractors get paid on a time basis. They don't necessarily get paid in a way that the commercial company would for a product, for example. So that disincentivizes um, fast working because they get paid for their time. It also doesn't provide an incentive for actually investing in your own R&D. Why should you? You don't really get paid for it. Um, if you come up with a better solution to the problem, you don't get paid for it. So we estimate that um, the R&D spend of those um, large defense contractors right now is only between 1% and 3%, so it's incredibly low. Uh, essentially what they do is um, they do kind of work that they get the requirements from government, they do the according work, and however long it takes, they, you know, they charge for it and they add maybe 20% on top of it as margin. That is not how you get innovation. Okay, so how do we get innovation? So let's, let's start moving towards our answer of, you know, what does good look like? What does a new generation of defense companies look like? And we had talked um, in the green room beforehand about certain principles that will be familiar to people who look at AI ethics and indeed many other forms of ethics in general, which is transparency, explainability and accountability and i know you have both have views on software and you've listed the many threats that nato is looking at so how do we get towards this new generation of defense companies in light of what you're saying is the shift that's occurred mm -hmm. lower r d spend or a change in incentives of r d spend and this shift towards this this sort of holy trinity of explainability or transparency explainability and accountability mm -hmm. how, do, how do we move towards that 
But it's probably worth saying is like what, what we mean, or maybe I mean mm. when I talk about new defense, um, th those are companies that are software first. They, they focus on software and they may have hardware or not. I think they're, they're different kinds of companies and maybe we can talk about them later. But they're software first. Um, they fund their own R&D, so they're privately funded. They spend their own money on R&D to come up with solutions that aren't necessarily immediately defined by uh, static government requirements. And thirdly, that they care about the mission. They care about the ethical side. They care about, as you were saying, trans transparency, uh, explainability, and everything um, else associated with it. And that is a core part of their culture and DNA. It's not just an add-on that you have to do. It is why people join that kind of company. That's how I would define new defense. And we were talking as well that NATO is moving towards this, this ethics model and that, that is going to be attractive both for attracting funding and the types of innovation and funding models that even NATO is looking at, as well as attracting talent. And there has been a hint in this conversation already that we should probably name the elephant in the room of in recent years among many tech workers working for a defense company might be seen as the equivalent of working for maybe big oil or tobacco or gambling, as in it is ethically bad. And that a change in thinking may have occurred, we can discuss that, based on or following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where suddenly it becomes quite apparent that not having a good defense strategy can be quite dangerous and that perhaps it is ethical to have good defense. So this, I'm, make, I'm painting it in very black and white, broad pictures deliberately to be slightly provocative, but how is NATO responding to this with the ethics review board, with the principles that are already in mind, with funding and with talent? Yes, so I think in general governments have been lagging behind technology when it comes down to regulation. Uh, and I think we're waking up to that. Specifically from a defense point of view, at NATO we've uh, uh, made the intention that we want to be a responsible user of new technologies. Uh, we've defined the new emerging and disruptive technologies that we want to focus on. There's nine of them, ranging from AI all the way to human enhancement and, and, and hypersonics. Uh, and with all those technologies, before they fully mature, we want to be the ones setting the standards for what we expect of manufacturers uh, when they want to work with NATO. Uh, um, and we want to be clear to the public that the way we use technologies like AI is in a responsible way based on our democratic principles and values. And, and to this effect, uh, technology per technology, uh, we will work on these uh, uh, basics. And AI is the first one we tackled. So NATO now has a defense uh, AI strategy uh, which contains principles of responsible use. It, it's a public document, uh, so accessible to all of the public. And it really explains uh, to companies like Torsten's what we expect AI applications to adhere to, from accountability to traceability and, and, and non-bias uh, within AI. And, and while well, Torsten we trust, but uh, others we also verify. Uh, so we have a data and AI review board which actually will operationalize this and make sure that in every stage we can verify that NATO forces using AI adhere to these principles. It's about creating trust with the public and clarity to companies that this is the way we as democracies uh, defend ourselves. So you've got the principles in place. We've got the board that's going to be reviewing them coming online quite soon. And that's going to be accessible to the public, to journalists, etc. So any of us, if we wanted or had concerns about how money was being invested or how technology was being used, could take a look at that. Um, I'm intrigued about something you said, though, which is the role of regulation and sort of who's, who's leading that regulation. Should it be government? Or sometimes we see that it can actually come from the company. So as, a, as a, the representative of the private sector, where do you feel on that? Do you want governments to be dictating those standards or setting those standards and yeah. guiding? Or do yeah. you want a chance to feed into them? I, I, yeah, so I, I think it's always useful to have a feedback channel and to be able to kind of say how we think, uh, think about things. But in general, there needs to be democratic legitimacy of all the technology that's being used. And that can only come if there, is, um, if there are government guidelines or where required government regulation. Transparency, explainability is actually a big topic. And I think it's not uh, as often talked about as maybe some other areas, for example, full autonomy. Um, being able to understand what a neural network does, how it makes decisions, is incredibly important in this, um, in this space. And usually the way a neural network um, works is that you, you give it data or, or you give it an input, it does a compute, and then it comes out with a result and it gives you a, a confidence number for that result. It might be 72%. 
In our opinion, that's not good enough in this space. You actually need to have a much better understanding of what's been leading to that result, both in terms of the internal workings of the network, as well as the data that the network's been trained on. And that needs to be done in a systematic way, and it needs to be done in a way that's auditable by people even afterwards, even after categorizations have been done. And from a technology point of view, that's not trivial to implement, especially at scale, especially with high performance. You have to do it with tools that people can understand, that human operators can understand. But I think government and um, alliances like NATO play a big role in saying this is what we expect, mm -hmm. so that companies know what to actually strive for. Can I ask, who would do the auditing of these technologies? We talk about for them to have democratic legitimacy, they need to be audited, to have transparency and explainability. Somebody has to be able to come in and actually take a look yeah. at the data sets, look at the algorithms, etc. Yeah. Who does that? So in case of NATO, uh, as everything we do is done by all nations, uh, so NATO is only the platform and, and, and a number of people like me working there. Yep. Uh, but we facilitate for nations uh, uh, this platform where they can actually do this. So the Data and AI Review Board of NATO will be comprised of representatives of all 30 nations uh, who would then be scrutinized by their own democracies at home. Uh, so we have, a, we have a double lock on the door. Mm -hmm. uh, and as everything within NATO, everything is done on consensus. Mm -hmm. So the doubt of one of the members within that board uh, would result in a no-go uh, for the whole uh, project system or application in this case. So if somebody in the United Kingdom wanted to audit this technology, I'm just thinking when we go to like finance, you would be like, you'd go to one of the big four in the city, I guess, and say, you know, open up your books um, to see if you're cooking your books or not. So in this case, are there companies here in the United Kingdom whose job is to do algorithmic auditing? Or is it the government that would do the auditing, like the government of the UK? Well, we will look after uh, uh, the applications that will be used by NATO's armed forces. Uh, we will do that ourselves. That's our data and AI mm. review board. Uh, we'll do that in, in, in conjunction with the manufacturers of that. So for the private sector, I don't know if there are AI auditing companies yet. I think Thorsen might have more information. Any thoughts? N not at this level yet, but they need to exist. And either the government um, outsources this to, um, to private companies that do the auditing, or, uh, and that will be part of our recommendation, they build up a degree of um, capability themselves so that there's a degree of self-sufficiency in, in, uh, in being able to order what's going on. And by the way, that's not just true for, for the neural networks, for the AI itself. Um, what's actually happening inside a neural network, it's also true for genuinely the source code yeah. um, underlying everything. And it, it's our opinion, for example, that companies like ours need to be quite transparent with the source code with governments and give um, governments the ability to also inspect that, which quite often with software companies is a, is a bit of a no-no, but we think in this case is required. That, on the other hand, means that the government needs to have a degree of, again, capability and self-sufficiency to actually do that. Mm. So we encourage the governments that we work with to start thinking about this early so that they can actually do something with that transparency and actually understand what's going on. And I guess it's not just unique to the defense sector. Anytime you're giving somebody a public sector contract, you would want it where the companies who are bidding for it can't claim that it's intellectual property, therefore they're keeping... They're keeping the secret sauce secret. It has to be open. And if you have a problem with that, don't work in the public sector, right? So there's, I guess, we're, we're at very, very early stages with this, but it could be the same for decisions in healthcare mm -hmm. or even like the court system as to whether or not somebody is you know, released from jail or set on bail early or not. All of those decisions that are public sector decisions would have to be auditable in order to be truly transparent and critiqued. And I guess the next question, this brings us to the human talent question, is do, does our society have this knowledge base and the processes and structures to do that, mm. right? So like are our investigative journalists out there equipped to do it? Are the companies equipped to do it? Is, you know, is Alan Turing Institute here in the UK the right institution to do it? Like who, if we had to start building this out, because we're not, it sounds like we're not just talking about a new generation of defense companies, it's actually much bigger than that. It's about the context, an entire ecosystem. So do you, are you seeing the grassroots of that anywhere, the shoots? I think so. I, I, I think we're still at the beginning of this. I think, first of all, um, you need to have companies that you can be audited in the first place. And sometimes I think in this debate, 
Um, we, we, we turn it on its head a little bit and we talk all, almost all the time about regulation and ethics. And, and by the way, I care a lot about those topics, but we, care, we talk too little about the actual companies. Like, how do we get those companies off the ground? Because otherwise there's nothing to regulate. This is actually, maybe slightly controversially, the bigger problem at the moment. There, there, is not, there, is no, there are almost no companies in the space. I mean, you, you can count them on one hand uh, internationally, to be honest. In Europe, you can count them on two fingers, probably. Go on, count them for us. Who are they? I, I think it's us, and it's probably rebellion defense um, in Europe okay. um, um, of, of, uh, you know, of the kind of size in terms of funding. That is actually problem number one. So I think one of the questions is, why, why is that the case? Why are there so few companies in this space? But when we raised money uh, last year, um, none of the VCs wanted to invest in defense, um, in, in particular in Europe. Um, they would either say um, their limited partner agreements would prevent them from doing it, or they just didn't want to be associated with defense because there was a stigma associated with it. And we felt even back then, I mean, we built this company out of conviction that we need to be able to have capabilities to, to protect liberal democracies. But um, a lot of people just didn't want to touch it. It's only since Ukraine that that's changed quite significantly. Um, but it's even now, it's, it's not that straightforward to, to raise a lot of money. And we raised um, uh, you know, our Series A, which was 102.5 million euros, from Daniel X Premium Materia Fund, not from a VC, uh, which I think is quite telling. In the U.S. it's slightly different. In the U.S. now there are funds um, that are able to write large tickets in defense. And I think also people who have the conviction that these kinds of companies exist. But that isn't the case in Europe. And I think the um, VC community in Europe has a lot of questions to answer. It is actually really quite poor, um, their performance in this space. Um, the interactions that we've had with some of the VCs right at the beginning uh, when we did our seed round were quite disappointing because they just did not want to touch the space. And, and this is the problem. That, that stigma needs to be removed from defense. I mean, we're trying to do this for the right reason. We're trying to do it to protect liberal democracies. We're not trying to do it to make a quick buck because it's not, this is not an easy space to make money in. It is very complicated, uh, especially when you work in Europe where you have to work with various governments. And so I think we need an ecosystem that supports this rather than makes it hard. Well, this is a wonderful segue um, into what I wanted to then invite David to comment on is the Diana Defense Accelerator in NATO and the NATO Innovation Fund. So it sounds like NATO is recognizing some of the points that yeah. you've just raised. And I think we have to also, we'll talk about the, you know, the money side, if you will, first to grow it. And then we need to potentially, I think, open it up to this question of where do defense companies sit? Do we consider them to be in the source of of good, are they ethical, or bad as in like the vice products? And I just mentioned that with regards to the problem of fundraising with a lot of the ESG reporting that's coming out, one of the big debates with Russia invading Ukraine was asking whether or not defense companies would be considered to have good ESG ratings or not. It depends on, I guess, the governance question, but it's also social and potentially it's even environmental. So let's start with the money first and then move over to this ethics Question. Well, you can't see one without the other, and I fully mm. agree with Torsten uh, on, on what we're missing now, which is interest in working for defense as a customer. Mm. Uh, and that has an ethical dimension, uh, so we have some explaining to do there to see that we are actually responsible users, that we are uh, fighting for our values and democracies as much as every citizen is. That's one aspect. Uh, the other aspect is, is it actually a good business case to work for defense? And everybody who's worked with defense knows that we have very long procurement procedures. There's a lot of bureaucracy in there. There's not a lot of leeway in uh, the requirements that defense sets. Uh, so we need to change that as well. And that's where Diana, the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, comes in. So that's our initiative to actually reach out to the innovation ecosystems. Don't come to us, we'll come to you. Uh, we will uh, set out problems that are uh, technologically uh, uh, daring. Uh, just to give you a hypothetical example, how can I communicate over 100 kilometers underwater, which is something we can't do now, uh, thereby stimulating new technological solutions to come in. Uh, we will then provide grants for startups for uh, over a period of maximum a year. Uh, and then in order to not let them fall into Death Valley, as, as Torsten mentioned, uh, because VC is hesitant, we're also setting up a NATO innovation fund, which will be a 1 billion euro um, a VC fund, uh, uh, multinationally run by the nations, uh, who will act as limited partners. Uh, and that fund can actually do uh, pre-seed or Series A investments into these companies that want to work on dual-use solutions in, in the defense and security sphere. 
So what we're trying to do is bridge the worlds uh, and do that in a responsible way, because uh, we know we need to reconnect. And is that also linked then to this question of, of talent, which I think we have to we have to discuss. So how do we get people who are going to work in this new generation of defense companies? What are the conversations that you need to be having, not just with your, your software developers and your data scientists, but also with the people who will be funding and running the, the business side of things, for lack of a better word, the finance side of things? Is it, is it difficult to attract it? Because pre-Russia invading Ukraine, only just a few months ago, there was a, a way of viewing this industry. Has that fundamentally changed, or is, that just, is this just a blip and we might go back to, no, defense is bad? Or has Russia invading Ukraine started to get people thinking again, not just about classical defense risks, like might China invade Taiwan, for example, is the easy one, but the ones that you were raising before about things like climate change, refugee crises because of food shortages and the like, energy transition problems that could quickly become defense issues. So it's requiring us to think more nimbly and flexibly about the ethics of defense. We have to think about defense more broadly, I guess, as well. Yes, and, and, and I think we have very fertile ground. As I said, we have great innovation ecosystems, we have great innovators. Uh, the problem is they often don't know what we need in the defense sector. We don't know what technology can bring. Very small example, uh, a startup was working on GPS independent navigation because a big supermarket chain had problem with autonomous vehicles in their tin roofed warehouses. Uh, great business model uh, to work for that supermarket chain. Uh, however, you've solved a critical defense problem that we've been working on for decades now, is how do we operate in GPS denied environments. So a lot of these technologies are out there. Uh, the question is how do we identify, how do we connect? Uh, and then the question is, how do we convince that actually working in the defense sector is to the benefit of our democracies at large? And, and that's what we've been talking about. But I'm pretty hopeful. I, I, I now have a, a, a vacancy for a head of innovation uh, for those who are still interested. But uh, it brings in hundreds of applications of very well qualified people uh, that want to make a difference for good uh, in the field of, of, of technology and do that for an organization like NATO. And climate change, it's the same. Uh, I think these people are looking for a purpose, and yeah. I think that we have a very good purpose. I also think it's, it's actually become easier with Ukraine. It, it is a shame that it took a cat catalyzing event like Ukraine to make it easier to recruit into the space. But the, the application numbers and, and the growth that we can now achieve, I think, is, is, is good. So I think that's possible. What's still missing is there are not enough founders going into this space. It's a huge issue. Um, founders, like especially ambitious founders who want to build multi-billion pound or euro companies, um, are not coming into the space yet. So I think that needs to happen. And one of the ways to make this happen, and in fact, one of the ways to make new defense companies successful and really bring innovation into the forces, is for governments to give new defense companies access to big mainstream programs. At the moment, what happens most of the time is that that new defense companies get access to uh, innovation programs that basically we sometimes call a kid's table. They happen on the side and you, know, you can do, show lots of great stuff, but it'll me never make it into the mainstream. It, for these companies to be successful, they have to be part of the mainstream. And so we've just recently been calling for a 20% spend target um, on new defense companies um, for major programs. Because that is going to be the only way to actually accelerate this and, and really make it worthwhile for founders, but also for investors to be in this space. Um, I'm just aware we've had the, the five-minute eyebrow raising. Um, do we have a microphone that's going to be able to go around for questions? Yes, wonderful. It's in the back. So I know we've thrown quite a lot at you. We were painting with a very broad brush over 30 minutes, but that's to give you room to express yourself. So any, any questions for our fascinating panelists, including if you want to apply for that totally <laughs> rad job? <laughs> Uh, we always hear about uh, Israel doing a lot of defense innovation and stuff. Uh, do you have a benchmark that where NATO wants to see themselves on defense innovation? Yeah, thanks for the question. And, and Israel uh, is really leading when it comes down to defense innovation. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, I talked about not knowing what the potential military applications of a certain technology could be. Uh, Israel doesn't have that problem because everybody is drafted. Uh, so everybody spends time in the armed forces, knows what the challenges and problems are 
that the military runs into, uh, then subsequently, uh, once they go into university, etc., that knowledge doesn't go away. Uh, so it sticks. So they see more of the business model. Uh, to be honest, the whole ethics issue that we've been talking about here has been less of an issue in Israel uh, because they feel it as a very essential, basic pillar to have a credible defense in order to defend themselves because it's proven necessary in the past. Um, so I think the combination of those two are probably the most important uh, uh, factors in why, although we have just a thriving innovation sector here, uh, as they do in Israel, that the connection is easier made uh, and the funds are more readily available as well to then follow up on that. Uh, so we do take it as an example uh, and, 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 and as part of the solution to how we can better reconnect and make sure that we get the, the same out of the, the large potential that we have here. Um, there's a gentleman in the back and a gentleman here up front, and you, so we've got three. Uh, I'm closest to the microphone. Well done. <laughs> uh, so I've been around this market for a long time, and thoughts on what you said just at the end there, th th I think that's a much bigger reason why there is an investment. I think the ethics is clearly important, but, but market access, I mean, the procurement process is so slow. And, you know, I, I advise venture capitalists on the, in, in this space. And it's really difficult, to Thorson's point, to get from, oh, that's really fascinating, you know, well done for trying, <laughs> uh, to actually get past, you know, Rhine Metal or British Aerospace or Lockheed Martin. So, and sometimes it, it, it makes sense to put a number on things, Thorsten. So, you're, you know, when you say you're asking for 20%, sort of SME input or whatever it may be. Who, who are you asking of that is question one. And, and then if I may ask from a sort of NATO perspective, does that make sense to you? And is that the sort of thing that you would be interested in actually landing? Because if we don't have that, it's a much bigger issue than the ethics piece. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that, VCs won't invest because there's no blinking return. Or yep. the, re the return is a maybe in 10 years time. Yep. So we're asking governments to do this um, and, and to set a 20% spend target and it's specifically to create a forcing function to um, allow um, uh, you know, people working in procurement to take risks. Because at the moment, um, everyone is very risk averse. It, it, it feels very risky and actually dangerous for, uh, for one's career to, to go for a new defense company. It's always safer to go for an existing company, even though it actually isn't safer, obviously. Um, the end result might not be what you want and it might take much longer. Um, but it, it, is, um, uh, it, is, it is safer from a career point of view. So that's why we think there needs to be this kind of shorthand of actually setting a target on the government side to go for the 20%. The one thing I would say is, so I agree with everything you said about uh, procurement is very slow. There are all kinds of issues. I think we also have to be realistic um, that we're not going to make all a lot of changes of that culture. That, that culture will hopefully evolve and improve over time, but we don't have that much time. And so this is, to my earlier point, that's why we need extremely good and ambitious founders in this space who find ways and levers to actually, I always say, to be unreasonably fast in this space, to surprise everyone how they manage to get to a particular contract. And I hope that we'll be able to announce soon that I think we have been able to do this. And, and we're trying to do this across multiple um, countries and, and want to encourage other founders to enter this space as well to show actually this is possible. You can actually make progress and a 20% um, target will help, but we're not going to rely on it, just to be completely, uh, completely uh, clear about that too. Thank you and, and good questions and I recognize everything you say and, and, and uh, we're here to change that. Uh, so I think the average NATO procurement process is 16 and a bit years, uh, which is rather long if you have a startup uh, that, uh, and you want to uh, feed your people. Uh, so <laughs> I think Diana and the NATO Innovation Fund are two very concrete initiatives that have to change that. So within Diana, at the end of Diana, at the end of the pipeline, we're also looking into rapid adoption service and we're looking into procurement within months. Uh, and I won't go into technical details here, uh, but that is the timeline that we're looking at. Uh, and in order to show that we have skin in the game, we have the NATO Innovation Fund. Uh, and that fund will actually be able to take equity in these companies, hopefully thereby creating a halo effect uh, and showing confidence to the VC market that we are actually uh, doing what we're, what we're preaching. Um, that VC fund, by the way, will be completely non-political. 
so there will be a general partner running this as a private entity. Uh, the countries will only be limited partners and they won't have any influence on the individual investments made. So actually the fund will make sound business um, uh, decisions, but based on dual use companies that either come out of Diana or are being seen in another sphere. I mentioned dual use because we feel that it will be very difficult in the future, uh, uh, exceptions uh, uh, being given, to have defense as your only um, uh, uh, client. Uh, and I think a lot of the technologies that we're talking about in the field of EDTs, uh, AI, uh, quantum, uh, human enhancement, biotech, uh, they will all have dual use applications. And of course, the commercial market will always be bigger uh, than the defense market can be. Uh, so I, I, I really admire Torsten, and I think that he's found a, uh, a, a field where it is actually feasible. But for a lot of these companies, I think we will stimulate them to also have a dual-use commercial arm uh, because it keeps their innovation uh, going. Uh, it's for an easier uh, business model, and we just want to be, we don't want to be the sole owners of technology, we just want to be the first adapters uh, of new technology from a, from a military perspective. Mm. Thank you. Couple more questions. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Tim Ensor, Cambridge Consultants. Uh, Torsten Davis, thank you very much. Um, I suppose a comment, really more than a question, the, the observation of the way in which organizations develop high innovation output it is a huge spectrum. And we've got massive experience in, in both defense and also medical. And what we see happening in medical is the frameworks they set up are very clear from the outset of what is the risk profile of this thing that we're building because that has a massive implication on day one of how you develop it such that when you audit it later, you can understand the steps that are required because of the risk of putting this innovation into, into place. And to the conversation earlier, in the US and Europe take very different approaches to this. The FDA have built up a large organization and you have to submit all of your details of how you built this product before they sign it off. In Europe, it's self-certification. Um, and so, uh, just interested in your thoughts about how the framework for submitting and auditing your innovation might play out in defense at that kind of detailed level. That's a great question. I love this, the tension of self-certifying versus having to submit to something like the FDA. And I guess in this question, it would be to whom would you submit, if, if not the FDA, who's the equivalent in this space, and particularly for NATO, because that involves so many countries. It's so many countries, and, and to add to the complication, we don't make any hard law at NATO. Uh, so we're not a regulatory body uh, like the EU is. We can't make any, any uh, laws. What we, what we can do is provide a platform for nations to agree, transatlantic in this case, on what they want those assets and, and safeguards to be. Uh, that's what we've done with our AI strategy. Uh, so all 30 nations, including the US, signed up to these principles of responsible use. As NATO, we will make sure that we have the mechanisms in place uh, to actually provide a service there in, in, in the data AI in review. Uh, and we're hoping that, for example, the EU, working on its AI Act now, uh, will take this into account uh, when drafting their civil legislation on the limits uh, uh, and, 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 and potential of, of AI. Because uh, from, from a NATO perspective, to have different regulations in the US and Europe, uh, is very complicated because we all need to be interoperable uh, when it comes down to uh, defending our, uh, our, our, our countries. I want to make sure we've got the, there were a couple, sorry, because of the light, I can't see all of you so well, but put your hand up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Nick Kerrigan from SWIFT. So, uh, so I work in the financial services space, um, but I'm fascinated by the conversation here. And I think what we saw in financial services was an incredible blooming of, uh, of new startups and, and also venture capital investment. But it was only really once, I think, the, the larger players in that space actually figured out how to do a path to production for these kind of either new technologies or capabilities that those startups were developing, that we actually saw that sort of innovation really ramp up. So I'm kind of curious, and, and what, what it sounds like NATO is getting on in the, to, to figure this out, but how you see a kind of real kind of integrated path to production happening for new uh, innovations in the defense space. Okay. Yeah, I think Torsten can answer for, for his own company because he's having that experience at the moment. In, in general, I would say that for us, 
uh, being NATO, uh, having access to an uh, enormous amount of end users, uh, having exercises, having access to the whole vested defense industry. Our aim with Diana and companies that go into the NATO Innovation Fund is to make sure that we do a lot of exposure and solution iteration uh, uh, with NATO scientists, with military end users, uh, uh, with defense prime companies uh, to actually make sure that we produce things that then have a plausible path uh, into integration into either main weapon systems as part of a capability or to become a cap capacity on their own. Uh, so I think exposure, the skill that we're doing at, uh, at that, uh, and, and the careful selection uh, hopefully helps. Uh, but we can't, well, we, we can provide water for the horse, but we can't force it to drink. Uh, so in the end, we'll have to see what goes through the pipeline uh, and how industry reacts to that and whether or not they're willing and able to uh, uh, venture into this, uh, this new avenue together with us. And just briefly for my side, I think path of production is, is definitely one element. The other element why um, a sector starts blooming, financial being one of them, maybe delivery companies being another, is that there are lighthouse companies that first of all show it can be done. Um, so um, all of a sudden people's expectations get reset. And there's a secondary effect, which is that those companies eventually produce new founders into the ecosystem that start their own companies. I, I believe and I hope that we're seeing the same thing in defense. I'm terribly sorry for anybody who had questions left. I've been given the, the sign, um, but I'll be standing out here afterwards. If you want to ask me, I can note your questions down and email, and we can perhaps sure. find a way to get you the answer, because I know it's so frustrating when these things get cut short, and you had a, probably the best question unasked. Uh, for now, all is to left to thank you and to thank our two speakers for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.